Thanks for joining us in a continuation of our Bible Institute series on the Old Testament survey. We're going to be covering the book of Jeremiah. And as we cover the book of Jeremiah, it's really interesting to me to note that this is a man who understands a lot of what we're going through right now. You know, for many, we're feeling exiled to our own homes. We're feeling like we're under house arrest at times, even though we're not. But we feel that way. And Jeremiah has been through a lot of those situations. As we look through the book of Jeremiah, and for those who may be joining us for the first time, you haven't been in a Bible Institute class before, Old Testament survey is unique. We're not going to dive into every verse. We're not going to look at everything in its minutia. But Old Testament survey is designed to give us a bird's eye view of the book. It, I want to help provide you with information, key information, that's going to help you in your own personal study. So that as you go back and you study more uh, in depth, you're going to have a good overview. You're going to have a good foundation laid so that as you look at the book of Jeremiah, you're going to have some key truths, some key understandings that will help you in the long run to understand more of what this prophet is trying to convey through the scriptures. In our class, we've been finishing up the book of Isaiah. And for those of you who are taking the class uh, at the normal pace, we may come back at another time and finish that up. But we're going to jump ahead to this book of Jeremiah and start studying and understanding what it is that God wants us to know from this prophet and from this book. If you uh, want notes, they are available. We sent them out on the email this afternoon. And if you did not get those or you would like them printed off, you can even contact the secretary and we can even drop them off or send them to you so that you can follow along a little bit more closely if you would like. So as we look at the book of Jeremiah, we're going to, for those of you following along, it's going to be on page 50, but I won't keep referencing those numbers. We're just going to look in, and go through the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is an autobiography or a biography of sense. It's a little bit of both, but it's Jeremiah writing about Jeremiah's life. And as we understand it, we know that Jeremiah is writing during Judah's darkest hours. It is coming to the end of Judah's time. It's brothers, it, brothers and sisters Israel in the northern kingdoms. They've already been taken away. They've been exiled to, uh, by Assyria. And Judah's been faithful to God. But we find the regression. We find them slipping away as we go. Really, Jeremiah is a book of transition. When we start in the book of Jeremiah, we're going to see that there's a good king on the throne. Josiah is there. Josiah is leading the people. He's the last king to bring a revival to the, the nation of Judah. By the time we get to the end of the book, there's no king on the throne. In fact, they're going to, uh, the nation of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to set up what's called a puppet king or a governor over the land of Judah by the name of Gedaliah. But there's no more king. There's no more. The throne of David's left empty as Jeremiah tells some of the kings is going to happen. We also see in the book that there it starts with the Reformation, the revival of Josiah. And then you start to see the regression of the people. You start to see them wandering away and walking away from God and after apostasy and after false worship and after idolatry. And by the end, they're in, they're in complete rebellion against God. You're also going to see in the book this transition that happens where at the beginning, Assyria is the world power. And geopolitically, you're going to see the shift that occurs, where by the end, Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar are going to be, is, is going to be on the throne, and he's going to be the one who is the world power at that time. We're also going to see the transition that takes place where the Jews are living in the land. There's still Jews living in Judah, living in that promised land, as has, uh, was promised in the Abrahamic covenant. By the time you get to the end of the book, the last of the Jews are being exiled. Yes, there's still some in the land. But you're going to find them, for the most part, being exiled to Babylon. You also see the transition that takes place. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem, starting off. That's where his ministry, for the most part, is. In the, in the capital of Judah, in that city of Jerusalem. And then what we find is, by the end, Jeremiah is going to be taken away and exiled, in a sense, even though he's not officially exiled. He's, he's taken away by force into the land of Egypt. You're going to see Jeremiah preaching to the masses and, and people li listening but not responding to his messages. By the end, he's just preaching to the remnants who've been taken away. He doesn't have people that he's preaching to. He's uh, sort of writing his letter and, and sending it off. He probably, if he could have uh, video chatted, he would have probably put it online and sent it off to the people in, in exile in Babylon. But he did what he could do at his time. He writes this letter. And he sends them information. He sends them encouraging words of hope that 
hey, after 70 years, God's going to bring us back to the land. There will be a remnant that will return. So Jeremiah preaches to that remnant. And when we talk about the book, the author, the dating of the book, uh, we're going to see it's, it's pretty clear Jeremiah is the author. If you look in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were at Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. So, so Jeremiah starts off very clearly stating, okay, Jeremiah is the one who is the prophet. He is the one who is writing or giving the words that are going to be recorded. Now, as we look, we know that Jeremiah in chapter 36, if you're following along in your Bible and you want to go there, uh, chapter 36 gives us a definite insight into what is happening with the writing of the book of Jeremiah. In fact, Jeremiah is commanded by God to write down the words that he, God has given to him. Chapter 36, verse 1, it says, And it came about in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the Lord, saying this, Take a scroll and write on it all the words which I have spoken to you concerning Israel and concerning Judah, and concerning all the nations, from the day I first spoke to you, uh, from the days of Josiah, even to this day. Perhaps the house of Judah will hear all the calamity that I bring, plan to bring upon them. So Jeremiah is even writing, and God is telling him, hopefully, you know, in this last-ditch effort, the people will respond. They will repent from their sinful ways. And what we find is uh, Jeremiah then in verse 4 of chapter 36 says uh, that Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah and Baruch wrote on the scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. So what happens here is that Jeremiah is right, giving the words, he's dictating them, and there is a man called Baruch. He is a scribe. Often if you're reading through different commentaries or books, you'll see this word called an amanuensis written. He's the one who writes on behalf of, of the other. So he's basically listening to the, the autobiography of uh, Jeremiah, and he's the one who's writing it down, and he's copying everything down. So uh, Baruch does that on behalf of Jeremiah. And as he, as he takes the time to do that, even verse 5 says, Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I'm restricted. I can't go into the house of the Lord. So he wants Jeremiah, or Jeremiah wants Baruch, excuse me, to take these words to the king. He wants them to take them to the people. Jeremiah said, I, I can't do that because by this point in his ministry, Jeremiah has been banned from the temple. Jeremiah has been banned from coming before the king and before others. And so Jeremiah is very isolated. In fact, we'll see the life of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet who at times feels very isolated. He's kept away. He's pushed away. He's, he's at times feeling very alone. And so Baruch, on behalf of Jeremiah, is going to go to the people. He's going to go to the temple. He's going to declare this. And then eventually, as it's read before Jehoiakim, the king, Jehoiakim is going to take it, and down in verse 22, it says, Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month, with a fire burning in the, in the fireplace before him. And it came about when Jehudi, one of the other men who had taken the scrolls from Baruch, and he was nervous about it, starts reading it before the king. The king gets frustrated. In fact, it says he had only read three or four columns, maybe three or four chapters into the, into the writings of Jeremiah. And he takes it, and he takes a knife, takes the scribe's knife, and he starts cutting it. And he throws it into the fireplace. So here's, here's Jeremiah's first draft of his autobiography. He's written it out. He's poured it in. It. Baruch has taken the time to handwrite all of this out. They bring it before the people who bring it before the king. The king takes it, and the king chucks it into the fireplace. In fact, he throws all of it into the fireplace. So what happens? It's interesting, down a little bit further in chapter 36, by the time you get to verse 27, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah again after the king had burned the scroll and the, uh, the words which Baruch had written by the dictation of Jeremiah, saying, God says this, Take another scroll, write on it, and write all the former things that you've already written. Do it again. You know, the one that Jehoiakim burned. And so God tells him, hey, I want you to do this again because these words are important. I want it, I want it there. I want the people to be able to hear it and the people to be able to know it. So you get to verse 32 
of chapter 36. And uh, it says, Jeremiah took another scroll, gave it to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the scribe. And he wrote the dictation of Jeremiah, all the words of the book, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned in a fire. And many similar words were added to them. You know, as I was reading through and thinking about it, I was wondering how many times would I, would I even do that? How frustrated would I, God, you wanted me to do this? And then you, you just allow this to happen when it gets burned up? You told me to do this. And I started thinking about it. Are there times that we plan for something? Are there times that we're, we're all intent and in doing what we believe God wants us to do and then it just falls apart? But then we get this notion that let's do it again. How many times with witnessing have I went out and I've talked with people and I've said, you need to get saved. And then they just reject it. It's like, God, this is what you wanted me to do. Why the failure? But he still wants us to do it again. And so Jeremiah, a great example of just that, that consistency and the willingness to do those things, even if it feels like, you know, God just wasn't in it at the moment. But God, he follows God. He's obeying God and he's following through. So as we see the, the authorship of, of the book, we can see that the book after this point, uh, the remainder of the book from like chapter 36 on, it had been compiled little bits by little bits, and we know that it has to at least be after 586 because 586 is going to be the final destruction of Jerusalem and the, the city and the temple by Nebuchadnezzar, and that's recorded in the book and the, the, the weeping over the city and the exiling out. So the remainder was written maybe shortly by 580 at the latest. So as we look at the book of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah was co-authored, so to speak, by Jeremiah and Baruch between 605 and 580 BC. So you have roughly 45 years, uh, 40 to 45 years of the book uh, covering that span and that time period and uh, being willing, being written during that time period. So as we, we understand that, we understand who wrote it, we understand a little bit about Jeremiah. Let's, let's go a little bit further. What do we know about Jeremiah? What do we know about this man? Let's go back to chapter one. And as we find in chapter 1, we're going to find the very beginnings, the calling of Jeremiah. We're going to find out about who he is, what he was like, and uh, how, how do we understand a little bit more? Jeremiah, he's, I believe he's very relatable for our time. The struggles that, that, that we have, as I alluded to just in the introduction, he faces a lot of similar things that, that we face. He has some of the same emotions that, that many of us face. I jokingly say the real men do cry. I mean, Jeremiah and I had that kindred spirit. Some of you who may be watching and uh, some of you who have been in our class, that's a joke that, you know, they call me the weeping pastor. That's okay. I'm fine with that. But uh, Jeremiah, he looks and he says, all right, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to follow after him. I'm going to find out what he wants me to be doing. So as we look at, we look at who this man is, let's look and understand about Jeremiah. Jeremiah's ministry is going to take place initially under Josiah. As we mentioned, Josiah is the good king. The last revival uh, takes place under him. In fact, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter uh, 34 and 35. If you want to go over there, you can. If not, I'll read some of those verses uh, as, we're, as we're going through. But we find ourselves uh, at the end of 2 Chronicles, and those of you who've been in our class, we, we covered this and talked about it. But... Uh, you find out that Josiah, when he was eight years old, remember he's the, the young child king, he, uh, he became king and he reigned for 31 years. And what happens is, is that Josiah is going to, in his, in his uh, eighth year, he's gonna start following after, uh, not the eighth year, he says, yeah, in his eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. So he's 16 years old, and Josiah begins to follow, begins to walk with the Lord. We know that by dating, this is 632 BC, and he's going to follow, he's going to walk with the Lord. Josiah is then, a little bit later in his life, he's, he's going to start purging the land of the idols. It says that uh, in his 12th year, so now he's 20 years old, he began to purge uh, Judah and Jerusalem of the high places and the Asherim and the carved images and the molten images. Basically, he's, he's ridding the world of Judah of uh, pagan worship, of the idolatry, of the, the, false, the false worship places, the high places where they would uh, falsely sacrifice. Now, if you look in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 2, it tells us that the Lord came to Jeremiah in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, 
king of Judah in the 13th year of his reign. So we're able to, understanding the dating and understanding the time period, we know that the Lord called Jeremiah in 627 BC. So now you have in the 13th year of Josiah, Jeremiah is going to be called to become a prophet. And it's interesting in uh, 2 Chronicles 34, that the next year, the year after Jeremiah is called to be the prophet, they're going through the temple, they're purging, they're cleaning up the temple, getting rid of uh, idolatry out of there. And what do they find? But in uh, verse 8, you remember in the 18th year of, the, of his reign, a few years later, in 622, sorry, it's like five years later, uh, when he had uh, purged the land in the house, they're going through the land and Hilkiah, the high priest, verse 9, delivered the money to the house and brought into the house of the God. And when he's in there, what does he find? But he's going to find the book of the law. He's going to find God's word again that was in there. And he's going to bring that out. It's going to really spark this revival. So you have this, this perfect storm of, of revival that's starting to happen. You have the prophet coming in. You have the word of God being found. You have a king who is dedicating himself to God. And God uses this time to remind the people of Israel of their responsibility to covenant faithfulness. That they are to keep after the law. That as they do that, they will find themselves uh, being in the land, being blessed, and God continually working in their lives. But we know historically, that's not what happens. Historically, they're going to find themselves regressing and not listening to the prophet Jeremiah. One little side note, if you remember in 2 Chronicles 34, the, the man who finds the, 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 uh, the word of God and the one who's going through is a high priest named Hilkiah. And then there's also Jeremiah's father's name was Hilkiah. Some have said it's the same man. Some have said it's a different man. We don't really know. I think there's really good argument to say that the high priest is going to be living. He's going to live in Jerusalem. He's not going to live in another city. But where Jeremiah lives in Anathoth, it's not actually all that far away. It's only about three miles. In fact, as he grew up in Anathoth, it's about three miles northeast of Jerusalem. It was a Levitical city, as we know in Joshua chapter 21. So Jeremiah, when you start thinking about this man, he grew up in a family of priests, surrounded by priests. He was understanding the word of God, and he knew that. Now, as we get into understanding Jeremiah, and as we look at the person of Jeremiah, you know, I keep saying he's sort of similar to many of us. Look at, look at Jeremiah's call. As we start understanding Jeremiah, he's being called by God at a young age. In fact, in Jeremiah 1, verse 6, it says, Then I said, uh, sorry, go, go back up to verse 5. Uh, God is going to say, Before he formed you in your womb, in, the, in your mother's womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, Jeremiah is going to be called as a youth because look at his response, Jeremiah's response to God. He says, alas, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak because I am a youth. Maybe in his late teens, early 20s, at the latest, but this is a time when God calls Jeremiah. And think about that. Here's this young man who God is going to call into ministry, that God is uniquely purposed to use for his honor and for his glory. As we, as we look a little bit deeper at Jeremiah, and you look at what has happened in, the, uh, in this story and in this account, even with this call, think about what God has done here. Verse 5. He says, I formed you in the womb, but before I, do, I did this, I knew you. I had a relationship. I knew who you were, and I knew what I had planned for you. In fact, he's like, I have a unique plan for you, Jeremiah. I have uniquely placed you at this time. Not only have I uniquely placed you at this time, I have set you apart. I have appointed you as a prophet. I have consecrated you. I have taken the time to say, I'm going to equip you. I'm going to enable you to minister in the time that I have placed you in. How fitting for us right now. As we look, as we understand all that we're facing in life, God has uniquely placed each and every one of us in this time period. 
He wasn't caught off guard that there's going to be a coronavirus. He wasn't caught off guard that we are going to be placed in this time period. Just like Jeremiah was uniquely placed, God has unique purposes and plans for each of us. He didn't mess up. He didn't put you in the wrong time. I know we joke about it. I mean, sometimes I'm like, I would love to have been born back in you know, the pioneer days to go out west and to settle. Or to, you know, some will say, I wish I was born in Victorian England so I could live with the castles and the kings and the queens. And we become discontent. But God has uniquely placed us here. And God has uniquely placed us at this time to minister to people here. How, how appropriate for us. But look what Jeremiah does. Jeremiah responds so much like many of us. Verse 6. He's like, God, I don't know how to speak. You want me to be a prophet, but I, I'm just young. I don't have the ability. He, and so he hesitates. He objects to what God wants him to do. He says, I don't know how to speak. He doesn't say because he's not like Moses where he says, I'm stuttering and I don't have that ability. He just uses the, the fact that he's a young man who's, I haven't learned how to do this yet. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to go out and, and I'm just going to stammer through something. You ever felt like that? It's time to share the gospel. God, I, I'm just going to mess it up. I'm going to goof up everything that I, I don't want to say the wrong things. And yet God's called us to do that. God's called us to be sharing with our friends, with our neighbors. He's called us to minister the words of reconciliation to one another, as Paul tells us in Corinthians. He tells us that we are to be ambassadors. The one who goes on behalf of him to the ambassadors of Christ, the ambassadors of the new covenant. Jeremiah is going to refer to the new covenant later on. He's going to lay that foundation. But for each of us, to, we respond very similarly to Jeremiah. I haven't learned how to do it. I don't know. I just, so I, I won't do it. But look at God's response to Jeremiah. Very similar to what God does throughout scripture. He looks at Jeremiah and he says, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth because everywhere I'm going to send you, you you're going to go. And guess what? I'm going to be there. All that I've commanded you, you're going to speak. Don't be afraid of them. For I am with you delivers uh, to deliver you, declares the Lord. What does God say? He says, hey, don't use excuses. Don't use your excuse of your youth or your speech. Why? Because where I'm going to send you, I'm going to go. I will be there with you. I'm going to be there with you when you feel like you're trapped in your home. Jeremiah, when you're in house arrest, I'll be there. Jeremiah, when you go before the kings, I'll be there. Jeremiah, when you're out among the, the, the common people, the masses, I'll be there with you. Jeremiah, when you're just ministering to your friend Baruch, I'll be there. And so he tells Jeremiah, wherever you go, I'm going to go. I'll be there. I'll be with you. He says that not only will I be there with you, he says what I'm going to tell you and what you are going to say is going to be authoritative. It's not going to be authoritative because you say it, but it's going to be authoritative because of me. Uh, Jeremiah is basically told, I wrote it down this way in my notes, God overrules his argument of youth based on the fact that the authority of the message lies in the one who is sending him. Our authority as we go forward, just like Jeremiah's, it's not in our own words, it's in the words of God. It's in sharing the words of God. It's bringing other people, as, as we've heard recently, talking about discipling someone to Christ. Jeremiah, I'm going to be with you. He says, don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you. So your authority lies in the, the one who is in control, not in you. Your strength and your confidence and your courage is the one who's with you wherever you go. If you think about it, think about this commissioning of Jeremiah, and doesn't it sound really similar to another passage in Mark, or excuse me, Matthew? We hear it often. You talk about the commissioning of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is told, go, and I'll be with you. Because all authority comes from me, Jeremiah, not from you. And go, because I'll be with you. Look at what he, look what he says, Matthew 28. You're familiar with it. 
Jesus is going to commission his disciples to go out and look at the promises he gives to them. In verse in number 18, Jesus comes up to them and he's going to say this. All authority, all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. So he declares his authority. He says, because of that, I want you to go. I want you to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. And how does he wrap it up? Lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world, the end of the ages. God's presence, God's power is with us. John MacArthur said it this way. It's been on your screen for a little bit, but Jeremiah's call highlights the principle that when God calls a person to a task, and he has called us to a task, he's called us to a task to represent him, to be salt and light in this world. He's called us to be disciple makers. He's called us to, to teach others. He's called us to learn, to study. He also equips that person. Like Jeremiah, we list our weaknesses. We list our limitations, but God promises an enabling presence. And like Jeremiah, we anticipate all the fearful situations, but God is going to promise his deliverance. You think about Jeremiah, man, this guy who lives all the way back, thousands of years ago, and yet still making the same excuses that I make every day. God, do you know? Are you, are you caught off guard by everything we're in, God? Do you know what we're facing? God, I want to talk to people. I don't know how. Give me the ability, the wisdom. How do I interact with my friends and my neighbors and, and my coworkers, even now in the midst of this whole coronavirus thing? How do we do that? Lord, you know we're here. You know we want to be sharing. We want to go forward. Help us, help us to do that. So we look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah is, a, is an interesting man. Very similar to, to many of us. What else do we know about Jeremiah? Jeremiah was single. In fact, God commanded him not to marry. He says, Jeremiah, I don't want you to marry. And it wasn't, it wasn't because of uh, uh, that this is a divine uh, command for everybody to follow. But in, uniquely in Jeremiah's position, he says, hey, I want you to not marry. He says, the, the word of the Lord came to him. He says, you shall not take a wife for yourself nor have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and the daughters born in this place and concerning their mothers who bear them and their fathers who uh, beget them in this land, they will die of deadly diseases. They will not be lamented or buried. And he goes on, but what he's basically telling them is, Jeremiah, I want you to remain single because Judah's future is extremely bleak. It's going to be filled with suffering. In fact, he even tells Jeremiah, a little bit more. He says, I'm also going to forbid you to be part of funerals. He says that in the next five or six verses in that passage. He also says, I don't want you to be part of any joyous celebrations. Jeremiah was used as a, as a his life as an object lesson in many ways. It was to picture what the people had done to God. The people had isolated God out of so many parts of their life, the sad, the mourning parts, the joyful parts. They had just begun to do their own thing. And uh, taking God and put him at a distance. And Jeremiah goes through life in a very isolated, a very lonely way. And so Jeremiah is going to face this aspect of being single his whole life, but that's what God had commanded him. An interesting application on the side note is how would you have responded, you know, if Jeremiah was your son? No, you got to get married. No, you got to have kids because I need grandkids. And yet, as Paul talks about, singleness is a gift from God. And we have singles in our church who are very gifted that way, and they're very content. And we should never look down upon them. We should never look and say, oh, they're single, what's wrong? Or why haven't they? Or what's, what's the matter? If God has uniquely gifted them for that, then God may be using them for a totally different facet of ministry that maybe some of us who are married can't face, can't do. And so Jeremiah here in this unique situation is used by God and is told to remain single. Not only does he remain single, he may have been financially, and we, we don't know for certain on this, but we do know there's a situation in Jeremiah 32 where he is going to buy back his, his kinsman's field. He has a responsibility as a, the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, 
his, his relative, probably his nephew or uh, uncle, one of the two, uh, is one bankrupt and doesn't have the ability to pay for his field. And so he goes to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah just, without question, just pulls out the, the silver and he's going to buy it. So some have suggested that he may be financially well off, but we're not 100% sure on that, but it's a good side note to understand. And Jeremiah has been nicknamed the weeping prophet. He, he's nicknamed the weeping prophet because he's an individual who mourns the spiritual dynamic, the spiritual state of people, especially his brother and fellow Jews. You look in, you look in uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, and you find, you find that he's, uh, he's really battling with the, the difficulty. He talks about, um, Oh, that the, my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of my daughter of my people. He's saying that it's, it's, we're spiritually decimated, we're spiritually dead, and his heart is breaking over that. And uh, in chapter 13, he, he comes again, he says, but if you will uh, not listen to me, the, to it, uh, to the Lord, my soul will sob in secret for such pride. My eyes will bitterly weep and flow down with tears because the flock of the Lord has been taken captive. So he's talking about that they won't turn. He's going to be weeping and he's going to weep because they're going to be exiled out of the land. Jeremiah battled and struggled with the people. So what happens after Josiah dies? Because Jeremiah writes a lament, he's saddened. I just want to quickly go through this in about four or five minutes here and wrap it up as we, as we go. Jeremiah preached that Judah will fall as well. So, so Jeremiah, look at, look at what happens. I mean, in chapter one, we stopped at a unique spot when I was, and I did it intentionally. Jeremiah is going to be called as a prophet, and he's going, to, he's going to do this. Verse 9 says of chapter 1, The Lord stretched out his hand and touched his mouth. Very similar to Isaiah, the, the idea of consecrating his lips. That his lips, his mouth, his words were going to be used by God to bring people to spiritual repentance. And the Lord said, here's what I've put in is my words to your mouth. So see, I've appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms, to do what? To pluck up, to break down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, and to plant. But if you look at those words, the words of Jeremiah were going to be very negative. There, a lot of indictment. A lot of the judgment is going to happen. The warnings. There's going to be destruction if you don't return to God. And even to the other nations. He's a prophet to the other nations as well. The latter half of the book is going to talk about his prophecies to other nations and saying, hey, turn to God. Turn to God. Identify and reconcile your lives with God. And he talks about that. But as you get to Jeremiah's life, because of this message, he's going to face a lot of opposition. And especially from false prophets. As we go through the opposition and the impact, just quickly, Jeremiah is going to face beatings. He's going to face public humiliation. In chapter 20, in fact, he's going to, he's going to find himself in a situation where uh, he's, he's proclaiming that uh, they're going to be taken into captivity, that Babylon is going to be taken in, and they need to submit to Babylon rather than just being exiled. And so he, he proclaims this, and what ends up happening is, verse 2 of chapter 20, they, the prophet Jeremiah was beaten and put in stocks at the upper gate. So here he is preaching and proclaiming the word of God, and then he gets beaten, and he gets put in stocks, and it faces public humiliation in, in, that, in that time period. In fact, we're going to come back to it. If you want to just stay in chapter 20, we're going to come back to there in just a minute to wrap up. He's going to battle false prophets. In fact, as you go through these different passages that I have here, Chapter 27, he's, he's going to lay it out, and he's going to say to these people, uh, right around verse 6, he says, Okay, now I've given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So that's what Jeremiah is saying. We're going into exile. Babylon is going to take over. Nebuchadnezzar is going to be over us. And the other prophets are saying, No, that's not true. There, there's no way. We're going to be our own nation. 
And Jeremiah looks at him in verse 9. He says, but as for you, do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, your sorcerers, who speak to you saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. Jeremiah says this, for they prophesy a lie to you in order to remove you far from the land, and I will drive you out and you will perish. He's speaking on behalf of the Lord. So he's looking at these men and saying, you're telling lies. No, think about it. You're living in your homeland. One guy comes and says, hey, you're going to get exiled. And all these other people are saying, no, we're fine. We're going to be okay. Who are you going to listen to? A lot of people started siding with the happier, the hope that the other false prophets were teaching. And so Jeremiah had constant battles with the false prophets. He had Jehoiakim seeking to kill him after he tears up the scrolls. He's looking to kill him. Not only that, you have King Zedekiah, who later on in the, the book is going to look for Jeremiah. He's going to bring Jeremiah. He's going to listen to his counsel. And then he's going to refuse to obey it. It's almost like, okay, let me hear what you're going to say. Yeah, I don't think so. I'm not going to listen to that. And so then he refuses uh, to obey it. And then you have Jeremiah, who's going to be arrested. He's going to be placed in prison. He's going to be taken out. He's going to talk to the king, and he's going to urge him to submit to Babylon, and then they're going to put him back in another house arrest situation. And that's right around the age 60, 61, 62. So for some of you might be sitting here and saying, I'm just going stir crazy right now. Jeremiah is feeling some of the same things, and yet he finds his trust in the Lord. And you got to wonder, what is that going to all do to Jeremiah? In fact, by the end of his life, Jeremiah is going to be taken against his will to Egypt. How does, how does Jeremiah respond? And we're going to wrap up here in this first session in chapter 20. Notice down in chapter 20, verses 7 through 18, you find Jeremiah facing utter despair, depression, difficulties. He's feeling alone. He's feeling like, what is the point? Why should I go through with life? Why was I even born? Faces many of the difficulties and struggles that different people and even different people right now in our lives and our situation that we're facing as a world are coming to grips with. But look, look what he says. Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone's mocking me, he says. It says in verse 8, For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction. This is what you told me to say, but it's just every time it's doom and gloom. He says, because those are the words you've told me to say. Verse 9, he says, I will not remember him or speak any more in his name. He says, but what if I said that? What if I stopped? What if I just stopped talking about God? What if I put it all on hold and said, I'm not going to be a prophet anymore. I'm just going to be one of the other people because I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the one who's going out and always saying, you need to get saved. You need to repent of your sins. You need to, it's like, I just feel like stopping. <laughs> Look what he says. He says, then in my heart, verse 9, the second half, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire. It's shut up in my bones. And I become weary holding it in. It's actually harder for me to hold that in than it is to say it out loud and for people to not be happy with me. I'm going to wonder about us in the gospel as we look at that. How many times are, I should say something, I, I don't want to. I'm just letting it out. Rather than holding it in and being wearied by, should I, say, I should have said something. Oh, I didn't say something. I missed that opportunity. Let's let the gospel unleashed. Let the gospel do what it's meant to do. Just let it out rather than holding it in and being fearful of what the people are going to say. But Jeremiah is facing that despair, that, that dejection. He says, I feel like there's terror on every side. In fact, look what he says in the second part of the chapter, verse 14. It says, Cursed be the day when I was born. Very similar to Job, chapter 3. Let that, let that day not be blessed when my mother bore me. He's like, throw my birthday out the door. That was a terrible day. He says, cursed be the man who brought the news to my father saying, a baby has been born to you. It's like, man, curses on that guy. 
Why would it, my life is nothing? It's worth nothing. I am, I'm unimportant and I'm just ready to give up. Utter despair, utter doom, utter gloom. Yet smashed in the middle of this is what keeps Jeremiah going. Look at what he says down in verse 11. He says, but the Lord is with me like a dread champion. He is the greatest of great champions. He's the one who can go through and just wipe out everybody else. Because the Lord is with me, I know that I have the victory. And so he's able to look and to go forward because he knows that the Lord is with him. Remember, the Lord promised him that. He says, from the very beginning. It's interesting, back to that idea of being cursed in the, the womb and being cursed. Isn't it interesting that Jeremiah wishes he had died in his mother's womb or right afterwards, and yet that's the place that God called him to his ministry. God knew him back then. God had the plan. And so Jeremiah is reconciling and battling with, God, did you mess up? Why are you allowing all of this, God? And yet God is using it and allowing it for his benefit, for his glory. Look what else Jeremiah says. Jeremiah says, yet, verse 12, O Lord of hosts, the God of angels and armies, you who test the righteous, who see the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them. In other words, Lord, I know you're going to take care of the unrighteous. It's going to be in the future maybe, but Lord, you're going to deal with the unrighteous and you're going to deal with the righteous. And he's just praying, may I, may I be able to see a little bit of that. May I be able to see righteousness exalted. May we see that in our nation, righteousness exalted. What does he go on to say? For to you I have set forth my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise to the Lord. For he has delivered, verse 13, he has delivered the soul of the needy one from the hands of the evildoer. Jeremiah looks back on the glory of God. He looks back to how God has delivered him in the past. He looks back to what God has done in the past. And he finds rest and peace and trust in him because of how God has demonstrated his faithfulness to his people. And as we wrap up, it had impact. Opposition, difficulties, uh, the, the constant warfare that was happening in Judah at this time, all of that had impact on Jeremiah, that he felt depressed. He felt struggled. He felt torn. And yet he comes back to, God is with me. And he has shown himself faithful in the past, and I will trust in his faithfulness now. What great words for us today. Despite everything going on in life, God's faithful. God has shown himself faithful, and we can trust in him and trust in his words because he's with us. We'll pick up in our next session on the rest of the book of Jeremiah, understanding a little bit more, but hopefully this has helped to give you at least a little bit of the background of who this prophet Jeremiah was.